Mother Knows Death presents External Exams with Nicole and Jemmy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. On this week's external exam, we will be talking with one of my best friends. Her name is Christy Salapata. Salapata. <laughs> and we're just, I, this is how our friend Ken used to say her last name. He used to call her Salapata, and we miss him. He was a, an investigator at the medical examiner's office while we were in school, and we loved him. And unfortunately, he had two heart transplants and ended up dying before he was 40 years old and it was really sad so yeah he was a good dude yeah he, he was. Really was so I first met Christy in 2007 in PA schools and the reason we're interviewing her today is because she's a PA like me but she specializes in pediatric pathology which we have to ask her why because I just don't understand why she's interested in it so we're going to talk about it and let's so let's talk about first when we met when we were in PA school, two thousand seven, right? Two thousand seven. We met actually before starting because remember you reached out to a couple of us and we wound up going out to what was it lunch or dinner or something like that? Oh yeah. And that place is no longer there. That was oh yeah that place what, what was the swanky swanky bubbles, bubbles that's yeah. right yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so before we started PA school, our program director had sent an email out to us welcoming all the new kids in the class or the adults, I guess you would say, <laughs> and we all reached out to each other kids. so we could meet each other because it's it's kind of cool when you're starting a program like this that's so specific and you want to meet everyone that you're going to school with because you're like, how is everybody like into this same exact field as me? So that really, I would say like when I met... Christy and the other girls in my class, we were such a tight knit group of people. And um, that's when I really like made a best friend for real. Like, and it wasn't until I was like, what was I 26 or 27 years old when I started school. So, but that like, we've been kind of inseparable since then. That's when the love affair began. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk. <laughs> she She's a little bit of a wild one. So we're going to have to reel her in. Uh, so what? One funny story that that I do have is so when so Christy used to live in the city and I lived in Jersey. So I would drive over from Jersey every single day and pick up Christy because we were rotating in West Philly at sim like different places. But a lot of the hospitals were in the same area. And I was at Children's Hospital at the time and you were at the M.E.s. I think I was at the M.E.s. Yeah. Or so, vice versa. Yeah. Something it was like that. it was something like that. And um. So I'm going to pick up Christy in the morning and on my way to pick her up, I, I stopped at Wawa to get coffee like I did every day. And that was when I met Gabe, actually. Right. So I meet Gabe in Wawa in the morning and I sat there and talked to him for like a couple hours out front of Wawa the day I met him. And I just totally didn't call Christy, didn't tell her like I wasn't didn't picking her for me. school. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. So it was <laughs> It was just really funny. So, so like she missed school that day. She just couldn't get there. Like it was just all this stuff. And I called her and it's just like, I met the love of my life. Like I'm just going to like you, you have to miss school today because I and she she understood, you know, that's what a good friend does. So Yeah. At first I was upset because my abandonment issues came up. <laughs> and then once she told me that I was like, OK, this is way better. I'm like totally acceptable. Yeah. So it it was really cool that she's like part of our story like that. So before we talk about what you do now as a PA, let's talk about what were you you decided to go to obviously what so when you go to PA school, it's a master's program. So you already have to kind of have a college degree before you even start PA school. So what what did you do? What did you go to college for initially? So initially I went for biology, just did a standard biology degree because, you know, in high school, nobody tells you, hey, with this degree in college, you can do X, Y or Z. Um, no offense to guidance counselors back then, but you were either a doctor or a researcher and that was it. So I knew I loved science. I kind of liked math, but I was like, I don't know what you do with math other than be a math teacher. Be a math <laughs> teacher. And I was like, now nah, I'm good. Um, so I wound up deciding biology was the way I wanted to go because I was interested in like animals and I was interested in the human body. And that's how I wound up with a bio degree. And what, 
so how old were you when you graduated? Like 22 or so? You went right from college, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or from for high school. High school, yeah, for undergrad. I don't know. That was a long time ago. <laughs> 1999, I think I graduated high school. So yeah. so when you so when you graduated from college, were you able to get a job? So well that so that's an interesting story and actually ropes into like how I wound up here. But so while I was an undergrad, I was like, I don't want to be a doctor. And I really wasn't into research, but I found a fascination with genetics. And it was more so aside from the obvious, you know, learning how genetics actually works and plays a role in diversity for human the gene pool, I wound up also being intrigued by dysmorphology, which should have been my first clue that this was like the calling. Something abnormal is what struck my interest versus just the typical day. Okay, so that's how you started kind of finding out about pathology and stuff? Well, kind of, but when I was like, hmm, I'd say around like third grade age, I was watching PBS and there was a doctor, once again, um, a doctor on TV and she was showing slides, these pink and purple images. And I was kind of fascinated by what she was talking about. And she was a pathologist. And that's when it all started. Oh, really? That's, that's cool that's that cool. you did, like got into that so early. Cause people ask me that. And I'm yeah. Like, when I was no, like nine or know. 10, it's really cool that I was into weird, <laughs> freakishly weird things and diseases. Cool. <laughs> so your Normal. undergrad, so once you graduated college and you, so you started working in th a genetics lab, right? So no, what happened was I didn't want to do research. I knew I did in undergrad, we did an internship and it was fun. I worked, you know, with like Western blots and I was working on that and just wasn't my thing. Like there was too much, like it was too boring for me. No offense to researchers, um, but it was just too boring for me. So genetics I wound up discovering genetic counseling as a field. And that's when I started to apply to grad school for genetic counseling. And then on that interview basically said, I also have an inter interest in forensics. And um, they were kind of like, well, do you have any experience in genetic counseling? And I said, no, I was like, I just think it's really cool what they do. So on that interview, needless to say, I didn't get into that program, um, but they set me up with a job my first job out of college, which was working with genetic counselors, which is where I found out genetic counseling wasn't for me. It was interesting in the fact that they were basically offering support to these families that had new diagnoses and what their kids had as far as like a genetic disorder or syndrome. And then that was like the extent of what I liked. I wound up going to clinics, seeing the patients, finding out a little bit more about the dysmorphologies and like what problems arise in the life of these children. But I was creeping up to pathology to go check out the lab. And I think that's when <laughs> it was very clear. I was going to say that like the whole time where you like, I want to see what these genetic disorders look like. Completely. I don't want to read about it. Like, I, what does this look like? You're saying all these different things like mm -hmm. remember you had that one song for like oh god the, it was that the apple bottom yeah, the app for edwards it was yeah. edwards and patel we were doing it was like rocker bottom feet and then i can't remember <laughs> the rest and i've been trying to remember it um but, but that just, helped us when we were taking totally our tests did. and stuff i was like small jaw and i'm like what else was it yeah <laughs> exactly that's funny so so then so how did you find out about our field because like this is kind of there was internet, but it was kind of, it, yeah, it exactly. wasn't great. That was the problem at the time. You couldn't find out about anything other than, like I said, being a doctor, a nurse, or doing research. So while I was in genetics and I saw this room, anytime the doctor had something that had to go up to pathology, I was like volunteering left and right. It was like anything to just go up there and see what was going on. Um so I started thinking, you know what, I need to get back in a lab setting because it was more of like a secretary's type of position I was in, although it taught me a lot and exposed to me, exposed me to a lot. Um, it definitely wasn't where I wanted to be. So I wound up going back and working at my undergrad as their lab assistant. And there I was doing like chem, setting up chem labs, bio labs, etc. During that time, they must have saw that I was getting bored and... <laughs> decided to have me teach anatomy lab and microbiology lab to the nursing students. Oh, that's fun. Which was a lot of fun. And then met one of the professors said to me, you know, I know you're itching to get out and you're looking for something to do, but I know this woman 
who works at a hospital and she does autopsies and she does organ dissection. And he's like, I think that's something you would really like. Well, he said that and I almost fell on the floor. I was like, my dream job. Yeah. I was like, no one tells you that this field is out there. So after that, um, I started looking into the field, the program. He told me her title, pathologist assistant. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I was like, I didn't want to be a pathologist. They look at slides all day. I'm bored. I'm not going to enjoy that. I want to get in there, eviscerate, dissect, and cut shit up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. that, And that's actually part of the theme of my lecture for Crime Con is mm -hmm. just like, because, you know, I always get that question, you know, why don't why aren't you a doctor? And right. you're just like, there's a little bit more to it than just to, to just that. Right. So you start PA school and that's how we met. And another thing I wanted to add is that when our PA program at Drexel started two years before we did. So it was, we were the third class of the, of a new program. So when we were looking into the field of pathology because I already worked in cytology, so I knew a little bit about it because we had PAs working at the hospital, but there was no program for it in mm -mm. Philly. And then the word started getting out around it. And we were, I believe our program wasn't even accredited when we started or or at least when we signed up. Yeah, I think when we signed so up. So it was kind of was risky like... to, to go into a program that's not accredited because basically they wouldn't let, we wouldn't be eligible to take the PA exam if it didn't become accredited. And that's happened before. It happened at Hahnemann with the mm -hmm. with some of the programs back in the day. So, and then we would just basically pay for that whole college degree, and they'd say you can't take the test, and right. you'd be screwed. So, um, so we start PA school, and so PA school is a master's program, and it's two years. The first year is was the classroom work, and that was just blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> but it was it was fun though. Was like fun. we got through it and it it was fun. And then the the la we we had such a good group of girls. There was what six of us that were just kind of very close and seven. Well, so yeah, yeah. including ourselves. Yeah. I guess six other people. Yeah. <laughs> Remember yourself. But um but yeah. Yeah, we and we still we still talk. We're actually trying to get together for like a old lady reunion at this point. <laughs> that is the truth. <laughs> yeah. But um <laughs> So yeah, we had a good time and everything. And then the sec so the second year we do our internship, which we just basically have to rotate at different hospitals and and morgues in order to get the certain requirements that we need for graduation. So we had to do autopsy rotation, surgical pathology rotation, forensic rotation, and um, children's hospital rotation. And so all of us had to do. Just to, and it's also good because it kind of gives you a feel for like what you would like as a PA, right? And the some, diversity of the yeah. field. And some some labs that you work in have a mixture of it, but other ones are like you could get a specific autopsy job, a specific children's job, specific surge path job. So when I went to Children's Hospital, I loved the PAs there. I had a blast. They were really really fun. But I hated the pathology part of it. I thought it was very tedious and sad and just like I just I didn't like it. So you you went and you loved it. Like what? Why? <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny because I was thinking about that answer to that question because I don't necessarily think like when I came into the field, I was like, oh, let me do pediatrics. This is what I want to do. And then I think over time, just seeing how, quote unquote, tedious, how detail oriented, how um, how much was involved with a pediatric specimen or even the autopsy, it just took another level um, to of expertise to be in the field. And I think that's what drew me to it. First, I'd like to say the people that we rotated with at the pediatric hospital, amazing PAs. And I think that also helped with it yeah you know, they, I mean like, I could see you would want to work with them because they were so right. much fun but like if they Beyond offered that, me a job I'd be like no and I like, was like yes we did an autopsy one time on like a 16 week fetus mm -hmm. and it was it took from like nine in the morning until four at night on one fetus yep. but in there now I always say this though like if I ever had a miscarriage or if I had a child god forbid that ever died there, there's no other people in the world that you want in charge of them besides a pediatric PA because because they do put so much attention and they know how important it is not only 
to give you answers as to why your child died, but also if you're deciding to get pregnant again or something like that, that they, they can figure out if you have some kind of underlying genetic thing that you're passing on and that this might happen again in another pregnancy. So the, your job is super important. And I think that a lot of times as PAs, we don't get this like recognition of doing because we don't ever have family saying like, thank you so much and stuff. You just you you have to be a person that's confident and don't need the recognition right. all the time, but know that you're doing something good. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's true. Like, you know, even just trying to even when I teach students right now or um, just thinking about what I do on a day to day basis, I take for granted how much we actually know and I take for granted how much we actually do because it's just something I do. It's not something I think about. And like you said, there's no recognition really outside of maybe your department. And sometimes depending where you work, that's not always something you get. You yeah. don't always get feedback. Um, but yeah, you kind of lose touch with that. And interestingly enough, thinking about it, you know, you go through these autopsies on these children and it kind of goes hand in hand in genetic counseling. I never made the association, but in genetic counseling, that's what you're doing. You're aiding some kind of guidance and help to the family that with their new diagnosis of their child. And on the flip side, if the child passes, you're now adding that new perspective or giving them some kind of insight on what happened, which then leads to possible genetic counseling after the, de the death of their firstborn or one of their children. Yeah. And just... And and you even notice that with adults, like when you when you explain to families really in depth, like what happened, it it helps bring a sense of closure to these people that at least they could understand what happened rather than just like not knowing. And even if you lose a child like that, like imagine having surviving children and just always being scared right. that something's going to happen. And just or or sometimes you could have an autopsy on a child and then find out that they do have this underlying health condition that like they could test the other kids for and prevent it maybe. Right. And there's just a lot that you do that you don't really, most people don't even realize that you have this job, right? right? It's just like this hidden thing in the lab. Or if you say, Hey, I'm a pathologist assistant. They're like, Oh, an autopsy. And that's about as far as it goes with some people. And they're like, Oh, it's just like on TV. And I'm like, yeah, every day I go with high <laughs> heels, makeup, a dress. I'm like completely to the nines, ready to do it. Oh and then God. covered in blood by the end of the day. Perfect. <laughs> I get that. Okay. So when we, when we graduated, so this is one of the disadvantages of being a PA because we were in Philadelphia and how many of us ended up graduating? Eight, maybe. We nine, ten or nine. yeah, like nine oh, nine students. Enough. Yeah. Just from one program. A lot. Just from one year. And there's definitely not nine PA openings in the Philadelphia area a year. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when we a couple of us already had jobs prior to graduation, but like you and LP and stuff that they had to move after we graduated to get a job because you don't want to just wait around and like pray that something opens if you you know right. you want to work. You have student loan debt to start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so back you, in the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you moved to Tennessee, mm -hmm. and you didn't get a job at a children's hospital, but you did do some children's. So yeah. So when I so initially how I started off with the whole entire moving out of the area, I lived in Philadelphia my entire life. So I was like, all right, this is a point where I can actually go somewhere, afford to live somewhere. Um, and start a whole new career, maybe a whole new life. So I applied out of state specifically. I didn't even apply anywhere in Philadelphia and wound up in Tennessee in a number one trauma hospital that also had a children's hospital attached to it. So I could get the best of both worlds because being a new graduate, I didn't want to lose anything that I learned in school. And I feel me personally, I just feel that when you first come out, that's when your knowledge is the strongest. So you want to solidify as much as you can. And I'm a hands-on visual person. So I wanted to be able to be exposed to everything I possibly could. And that's how I wound up there. I taught residents when I was there, which was even better, which was intimidating at first until I realized how much I actually knew and how easy it was to do that. And it just solidified everything from school that was in the back of my mind that I never put two and two because you're just trying to get through the program, trying to get through your rotations, learn everything you can. 
So it really solidified everything for me. I find that with pathology residents too, that even though they're technically doctors, they don't they don't really learn stuff the way that we learn Mm-mm. stuff in path as far as pathology especially like gross findings and what to look at like when you're actually that's like my, uh, macroscopic like what things look like with your eyes they just don't really they're not taught that and they're not taught their purpose of being right there. like you have to prove why the surgeon took this out kind exactly. of thing um so i think that we offer like a really good role for mm-hmm. them because if they're learning off another pathologist, they're just not going to get right. that. That's, and I, well, I feel like. And I think, like I was just saying, you know, you're just trying to get through everything. And like being a pathology resident, you're now specializing in pathology, coming with the background that every other clinician has. So how do you tailor it down to the specific field that you're in? Like, how do you actually get that focus? And I think that's where we come in and we can offer that to them because we are that focus. We're like pigeonholed into that area that that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And I think that any good pathologist in and even surgeons, when they come down to the lab, they recognize mm-hmm. that we are like the go to person. For sure. <laughs> for sure. So That's what I used to actually joke around when they would come down for frozens and, you know, we'd have a piece of tissue that was maybe like a centimeter and they'd give me like a millimeter and say, can you freeze that? And I'm like, I'm good. But like you're pushing it here. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember because Andrea, uh, when um, she's another one of our friends, that she used to be like the main frozen PA. It's like the top surgeons at the hospital would come in and be like, "Where's Andrea?" Right. Like they'd have a panic attack if she was <laughs> off. You know what I mean? So true. Which was which was like really really cool. So so you work at this hospital in Tennessee. Did you see when you were there? So since it was in like a trauma center, mm-hmm. did you see anything like cool while you were working there? Absolutely. So the one. One defining factor that pediatrics, we are on the difference between pediatrics and adult pediatrics. We're 100 percent on top of things. It's a kid. We want we're really interested in their health as adults. We neglect ourselves, deny things and kind of just let things stew and stimmer. And um, so when it came to cancer cases there, you would get I remember I had like a lawn of genital warts that was like two feet long by one foot wide. And I was like, what the, I was like, who, like a pimple. And I'm like freaking out. Like, how did this happen? Or, you know, another one was a melanoma that was solid, probably a good like six inches by six inches and about three inches thick on a mom's pubis. Like I was like. Your favorite anatomical part. (laughs) (laughs) I could go inside so, joke inside I, joke. I could go down the rabbit <laughs> hole, but we'll just skirt around it. Um, anyway, so you know, like seeing this, I'm like, an ingrown hair would freak me out. Let alone this whole entire huge mass. It was just always crazy things that I would see. There's always this sense of I think when you work in pathology, you don't realize that people. I, I mean, obviously. In America, people have access to health care, but some of them don't have insurance and they're scared of the cost of mm-hmm. it. So in it, that's what's different than other countries that don't have access to health care, because sometimes you could say, oh, the closest hospital was six hours away and they just they, they're poor and they, right. they can't do it. Like, how but are we here there? You, there's a hospital everywhere. The problem is, is that you have the health care issue and then you have just people, which I feel like is more common or just straight Being up people. and like they're in denial and they right. just they just ignore things mm-hmm. and it's really mind blowing some of the stuff that you see that you're like how are people so checked out that mm-hmm. they don't they don't they think this is going to go away or or you know it's absolutely it's just crazy so um so you're working in Tennessee mm-hmm. and then a job comes up at the children's hospital and then you decided to kind of leave all that and go work in a children's hospital actually i was back in the adult Wait, world oh, before that yeah, that, so, that was the other oh okay sorry so while i was down I there i can't keep track of, of your timeline of I, I jobs know. okay yep. so you want i i know like you wanted to come back so yeah it's like your parents are essentially yeah so what wound up ha- wound up happening was when i was down there working on the adult side um things got a little chaotic they wound up trying to keep me a little bit longer and pushed me off to the ped side which they managed to keep me a little bit longer um and i got exposure to more pediatric specimens being there and then i wanted to come back in the area i was kind of missing home missing my friends and uh 
came back to this area, worked back in the adult side of pathology and loved it. Once again, saw crazy things like pelvic exonerations. And, you know, you have an organ block that somebody had colon cancer and all of a sudden you don't only have a colon because they're like, oh, I, I couldn't pee a little. And well, here's your colon. Here's your bladder. Here's your kidney. And oh, there's your uterus. Cool. Like how'd that happen? You know, like I, I actually think that that they're I heard they're really not doing those anymore, anymore. because they well, they found the I know I know, <laughs> but I I've, I've had some too yeah. in my earlier years, but I think that they found that it the 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 outcome is no different. So like, why put someone through, through that? All you know, of that. yeah, because one of our friends, um, mom had more recently had one for like metastatic melanoma, Ooh. and it's like the 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 recovery from that it's like if you only are gonna have five more months to live like why would you ever why put someone through that, that yeah. imagine not being able to pee poop yeah i mean that that would i guess eventually they rework whatever they give you right. a, new, a new bladder or whatever but it's not it's major functions that you have to do multiple right. times a day or a week and you just it's just crazy mm -hmm. to even think about healing from that so so you worked in the adult world and then this job. I I so, know that like you were holding out for this job, like so, you were well, waiting. I was in a <laughs> sense, but what actually wound up. So yeah, what wound up happening was they had a per diem position at a local children's hospital. And I was like, well, I could use the extra money. I can use some extra time. I said, and it'll get me once again back in the field. So I was like, oh, I'll call up and see what the per diem deal is. And at that point, when I inquired, they said, what if it were a full-time position? And I was like, mm, I just I just moved and back and I just got this job and they're really happy with me here and I'm happy here and now I'm going to jump ship. Whoops. <laughs> like, so I wound up considering it um, and then took the job and then started another, I think I was there about four or five years in peds again and learned a lot, know a lot to a fault. <laughs> um, and that's when I wound up back in peds after that, went back to the adult side for a little bit and back in peds again. So clearly the universe wants me in pediatric pathology, <laughs> despite me trying to jump ship every once in a while. <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> so it's, it is, it is a very different world mm -hmm. than, it, than regular pathology because it's, it's slower. It's a lot slower and it's a lot more tedious. Mm -hmm. So that could be good because some days it's just like a little bit more, not like a high strung mm -hmm. kind of environment. Whereas working in the surgical lab, especially with frozens and stuff could be like high, a high stress right. situation. So, Absolutely. So I could see the pros and cons of, of wanting those jobs. But so I guess, so I have a couple questions as far as pediatric stuff goes because all the hospitals that I've ever worked with we dealt with miscarriages and stuff and and a fetus a full the whole entire term of a fetus as well as like infants but past that we we don't we don't typically do children mm -hmm. in in the normal hospital yeah, or even tumors or anything you don't yeah, normally they, say. like they just exactly like you'll get an append appendix and stuff from little kids all the time but when it's something like like a cancer especially it's like they send them all mm -hmm. and it, and i guess in our area we have a major children's hospital so like why, why even, not why even right. mess with that absolutely so what like if you get surgical specimens in the children's hospital like what are the most common things that you get so some of the most commons that we get just like you would learn in school the most commons would be um the kidney tumor which is known as a wilms tumor okay and then we also get like osteosarcs which are bone resections which they're kind of my favorite specimen, kind of. So do they take, um, like, if where, where's the most common location for, for osteosarcs? Yeah. So they're usually in the long bones, and they're usually at the growth plate down towards, like, the end. So you'll see them in your humerus, which is your shoulder, or part of your shoulder, your upper arm, and then your femur, which is your thigh. Um, you can also have them in the ribs, and you can also have them in the pelvis, but... Mainly the long bones are where we see them in. I've had a couple in the humerus, and I've had several in a femur. So if you get a, an osteosarc from a femur, do you do they 
give the kid an amputation or like how do you receive that so they try to do if they can they will do a limb sparing so if it's in the distal portion they'll keep the proximal portion that's where it attaches to the pelvis uh -huh. um in your hip joint and so they'll keep that portion and only take the distal portion and put a prosthetic in oh that's interesting yeah so they can also do it where they spare the skin it just depends on when we found yeah the lesion and typically they present as just pain there's sudden pain there's swelling some kind of discomfort kid goes in has some imaging done there's something Jesus, in the this bone is, this is what was my biggest fear when like I, I i've talked to, i did a mystery diagnosis a couple years ago that my youngest was diagnosed with something called non-infectious osteo chronic non-infectious osteomyelitis um and it it started off with like the dist the mm -hmm. distal femur like knee pain and then we went and got the x ray and then they called me and they said you have to come back right now and i automatically was like oh my god this kid's got cancer in her knee like i i flipped out and thank god it didn't end up being that but like that location and that presentation is just yeah the serious downfall of our field is knowing way is too much knowing way too, way much. too much exactly so so you get these specimens that have um that have tumors so sometimes mm -hmm. you get like amputations and things like right. that. right so we'll get like for instance with the osteosarc we'll get a piece of the femur or we'll get the whole femur depending what it is um in adult hospital practice what i've come to know is that you wind up shaving off all of the soft tissue from the bone so there's muscle surrounding the bone that you'll get their skin so you shave all of that have to keep orientation in case they have to go back if there's a positive margin etc and then put it all back together and make it make sense in your gross in your pictures etc whereas at least the children's hospitals i've worked at we wind up actually taking the specimen soft tissue and bone freezing it all together while it's fresh then fixing it um so let me go back a little bit after it's fresh we wind up cutting it completely frozen in a saw which gives us beautiful sections that show the actual relationship between the soft tissue and the bone and use like a band saw or something. like a band saw just like a butcher does yeah so that's interesting too because a lot of people don't realize that we have to not only like be experts in all of this kind of stuff but have to use power tools wood shop would have came in handy <laughs> along the way yeah. and the ba so the 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 oscillating saw is a little bit less scary that's the kind of saw they would use to cut off a kid's cast mm -hmm. or something so if you're using it and it hits your hand or your your soft tissue like it it's more of like a friction burn, mm -hmm. but you it won't like cut your finger off. Correct. Whereas like a bandsaw could cut your finger yeah. off. It's a real, it's a really sharp saw, and obviously if it could cut bone and soft tissue that's frozen. Yeah, and these are huge. You're talking about a bandsaw being about I guess it's like two feet of a reciprocating blade, or actually yeah. And one of the institutions I worked at, we cut a femoral head, which is a whole what whopping like three inches in diameter yeah and it would have to go through this machine and there you're you're holding it with tools and gripping it on for dear life as you're trying not to cut yourself or have what i had in one instance have the femoral head go and hit oh my god hit the wall behind me and give me a heart attack and uh, you know it's it's a lot so so we had this one at one of the hospitals i worked at because we got a lot of these like jaw resections mm -hmm. It was the kind of I, I I don't even think it was made for human tissue. It was like a tile cutting saw. Right. It was like a very little band saw that had like water dripping mm -hmm. off of it. It was crazy, but because we had like little tiny jaws to stick through, right. you know what I mean. But so okay, so you also get like, it, are these are children's hospitals considered like trauma? units too or like how would that work there are but i you know for us for trauma it's usually same thing even when i was at the other place that was a number one trauma it's usually some kind of lawnmower accident um, or fingers got crushed by you know a hammer or something kids being kids i want to say i hate to say that sometimes but that's usually what it is it's not so much as what you would have in an adult like hospital and what about like do you get foreign bodies and stuff from kids and like we do weird it's shit usually those stuff? little round magnetic balls oh my God, do not so buy them for any of your kids um yeah they always seem to come down and we get like a chain of like 12 of them and it's like cool <laughs> like, they're no really wonder. dangerous like we did um a high profile death dissection for mm -hmm. toys at christmas time and that oh was one of them that kept coming up in in the literature too yeah that 
because they like make the segments of bowel stick together. Mm-hmm. And, oh my god! And they look like those little what were they? Those little candies that were round balls that were like cho- filled with chocolate with the oh, outer the sickles. Or yeah. Whatever. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what they look like. So if I was a kid, I'd be like, oh cool, let me eat one and not think anything of it until I'm like having poop and problems and all of a sudden I'm like oh, not feeling good. Parent nightmare. That yeah. and batteries, the little watch batteries are the little, you know. Yeah, they're they're bad they're too because they could erode mm-hmm. and they could cause like perforations and yep. stuff. Oh my god! Yeah, we we I think that actually when I was writing that up this Christmas that there was this ban on them for a while. Mm-hmm. They weren't allowed to be sold, and now they're like on Amazon again. There again, yeah. And and parents just don't. It right. the, another one that's dangerous is those. Or bee beads, you know what they are? They're like these little plastic beads, and when you put them in water, they they like swell up. Oh, so they're like the kids, you know, yeah. they like to. The, it's like this sensory thing, right. but like which is fine for my age kids, but little kids, if they eat the balls when they're yeah. little, they like expand in their GI tract and right. cause obstruction. Not good. Yeah, and th- there's a kid that actually died from it, and it said that the, the mom had bought them at target and that there wasn't a warning there was a warning label that said that there was a choking risk but it yeah. didn't say there was a risk for ingestion and obstruction and she's trying to like say something about that right. which i i don't know I personally don't know. like the kid was nine like i'm like you shouldn't have had it near your nine month old kid i don't care right flow but- some blueberries in water and let them <laughs> do their sensory activity with peas or something yeah even. <laughs> exactly <laughs> Not not the plastics. This episode is brought to you by my book, Nicole and Jemmy's Anatomy. Do you have my book yet? If not, you better get it because it's really awesome. It is an A through Z journey of the human body and everything that could go wrong with it. Get it now at thedoramater.com slash book. So when you when you get autopsies now, mm-hmm. so one of the cool things that, that I didn't realize being in the, the children's hospital was that you said from time to time you do autopsies on adults. Mm -hmm. Can you explain like why you would ever do that? So sometimes we have cases where clearly not every disease is curable. We're still working towards cures. We're doing research, which is another aspect of the job. Um, But you have these patients who could be 18, 25, still with either residual tumor or still um, struggling, even with a late diagnosis. Actually, there was a case that we had a late diagnosis. By the time they found out this patient had the diagnosis they did, the patient, it was a male that died maybe a couple days after that. And uh, so sometimes it's a late diagnosis of a quote unquote childhood tumor that you wouldn't normally see in an adult hospital. So we might have a reference from an outside hospital to take this patient on, although they might be in their 20s. You also have, I had a case where 18 years old had one of the forms of cancer, I can't remember which it was, signed his autopsy consent to donate his tissue for research because he had a significant size tumor. Yeah. And I think at that point, whatever the staging was, he knew he wasn't going to last very long. And that was, that was an overwhelming, like humbling experience right there because I couldn't imagine being in a position to sign my own autopsy consent and being 18 doing that yeah that's it's like it's it's so cool that people are that are like that enlightened and mature correct to think because that that is the only way for for us to to, you know it's more why people so sent the dead teach the living it's just like the only way to really do that and like even talking recently about oj dying right Mm -hmm. And him not like it's right. just so fucking selfish, right? Like, I'm just like this guy who there's all this suspicion that he might have like CTE from all the trauma of playing football all those mm-hmm. years. That that could have maybe contributed to him snapping and doing what he did and stuff. Right. Like you would think, okay, well, like I'll donate my brain to science just to see because that would he even help like future football players and For stuff. Sure. It's just like why you're just going to incinerate it and be buried mm-hmm. and it doesn't help anybody but i i love hearing stories like that of people that are just like listen my time on earth is is gone and and people do it with their families too mm-hmm. me and crisper are like really huge proponents of yeah, the organ donation for sure so um so getting to that like you you said that that was like a humbling experience for you did do you feel like sadness towards some of your cases 
For sure. Um, when I first got back into pediatrics, there was, I think, a 13-year-old who was having a workup on, he was having some kind of neurological dysfunction. Um, and they were working on it, working on it. And unfortunately, they didn't find out what happened before he expired. And that was one of the first case I had. And I remember just like, I can't imagine one being the parent in that position that, you know, something's wrong with your child. The clinicians are trying really hard to figure out what's going on and you're almost there. You're working towards it. And then all of a sudden they just, die. they just yeah. die and there's no longer that opportunity there. So I can't imagine it from that aspect. Um, and then standing there and you're like, wow, this 13 year old, how many people has this kid touched their lives, you know, encountered, he's made friends in school. He's, you know, adult family, his peer group gone. Yeah. Like there one day gone the next, no warning. Yeah. I, I, I hear about that sometimes with kids, um, just on the news mm -hmm. that we cover all the time about kids that get hit by a car or just anything and, right. and then they'll say like they'll just put this brief thing out like oh there's grief counseling at the school mm -hmm. and and you're just like yeah that's I, it's so hard especially for children to right. like grasp that and just being a parent like i i can't even like wrap my head around Absolutely. that like it's just and it's weird like i feel like i feel like when i do an autopsy on like a fetus i do i do feel bad for the parents but i try not to like Mm -hmm. sit there and want to cry because like i i want to get the job done and stuff but i definitely have had times especially rotating at the children's hospital right. that i like even how long ago did we graduate 13 years 13 ago 13 years ago or whatever like a long time ago <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i just like no it's been longer than that we we graduated 2009. in 2009 oh. jesus that's why I'm into math. I just gave up. Really. Yeah. Good thing you weren't a math major. Thank God for, but, thank God for calculators. But anyway, um, <laughs> right? I'm like, is aren't we approaching like 15 years? So anyway, um, regardless, uh, I just totally <laughs> forgot what I was talking about. But but still. The whole patient interaction yeah, and everything just, and the human aspect of it. So you basically you're focusing on a task, getting it done. Yeah. But, but, but oh, that's what I was going to yeah. say. So. So Children's Hospital, like, I remember the kids that I autopsied still. Like, yeah. I'll just never, like, the big sure. kids, like, the For teenagers sure. and stuff and the and the eight-year-olds mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, because cause they have parents. They all have parents. And you just can't help but think that, right? Absolutely. Well, and that's another, there's been a couple times that I, you know, first off, when we do our job, we need to be informed. We're not clinicians on the floor with them. We don't get the interaction that nurses do with the patient but we still have to go back to the chart review it figure out what's important and what we have to focus on for the autopsy and for the case so reading the chart you get into very like personal notes from like social work and everything and then it really brings the human element in which not that i want to think about it focus on it because i have a job to do but it definitely s makes you step back for a minute and makes you really like think wow this is terrible. And then once again, you have to pick yourself back up and get to your purpose. I'm even like that with the St. Jude yeah. commercials. Like I can't, you I can't just watch can't them. watch them. I just, I, I'm like, take all my money. I get what you're doing. Like, just like, I'll write you a check. Exactly. I just can't. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so heartbreaking. Like, it'll be a parent just saying, cause you know, my, my kids, my, my younger kid anyway, mm -hmm. Lucia still believes in Santa Claus. Right. Like, it's like, how do you talk to a child about something so heavy, like cancer or, right. or any kind of like a, like a life ending situation? It's just to, like, I just, it just breaks my heart right. so much to even think about it, that it's just better to like, right. be disconnected a little bit. Absolutely. So, that's, that's the one thing I don't really love about the job is having to actually dive deep in the chart but you know after the fact when you I had a case actually they did um I think she the patient was a, I think she had a brain tumor and wound up donating her brain to research so here I did this case then on the weekend there was like some kind of fundraising walk for the research for brain tumors and I wound up meeting this person this patient's parents oh, God. at the walk I was like, this is this is a little much. Like you you don't know what to say. And then how do you walk up to them and say, 
hi, I did your daughter's autopsy. Like you just don't. Like you're just kind of no, like, oh. exactly. <laughs> oh hi, hi, hi. We we literally Annette and I literally had the same exact thing happen. We were working in the lab and we get this frozen section on it odd, but a colon tumor mm-hmm. that which is not normally something. So a frozen section is when they send a specimen down while the patient's still open on the table and we have to examine it. And usually that's only done in the case where like the surgeon needs to know right away what something is in order to direct the course of his surgery or his or her surgery. But in this case, they sent it down to us because it was so weird. It was a 19 year old and they sent it down to us because they were removing this colon because this girl, this 19 year old had an obstruction and they just couldn't believe it because on imaging, it looked like it was cancer. Mm-hmm. So they sent it down to us and said, open it up and just look at it. And and then so we cut it. And just by looking at it on frozen section, it was like already perforated through the wall. It was bad. It was like at least a, at least a stage three at that oh. point. Right. Nineteen. Right. And we were like so upset. Annette and I. Mm-hmm. So we go downstairs to the coffee shop at lunchtime and th- we hear this this mom on the phone like behind us like talking about oh she's in surgery right now it's probably nothing like and I was like oh my god Mm -hmm. like it was it was just so like you just wanted to throw up you know because I'm like this is this poor lady is having like this last moment of not finding out Mm -hmm. how bad this can be and of course the disadvantage to our job is like we we have no idea what happened to that girl like did she live (laughs) did she die like we don't we hear nothing else. That's right. the end of the story. And then on the flip side of it, for me, it's always, you know, I always stand there and I, my face, I can't hold anything. My mouth will hold it back. My face says everything that my mouth will not. And, you know, I had a, my, one of my mom's friends, my mom calls me and she's like, she got diagnosed with stage four inflammatory breast cancer. And I was like, oh God, like this woman's going to die. That was like my first reaction to it. And I stood there and I was like, mm-hmm. I see, you're good. Cause I just like w- when my mom was like, Oh, nanny has, this is my grandma has yeah. gallbladder cancer. I was just like, you better prepare. <laughs> She's going to die from this. And my mom was like, no, like they told us that they're, and I was like, mom, mm-hmm. like, I just can't keep my mouth right. shut. Like, I just can't like, I was like, just tell her to spend a lot of time with her kids and her husband. It's <laughs> really important. I was like, I know. What do you do, you know, I know. I just, I feel so terrible, but I, I don't like, and this, this is like a good reminder with my grandmom and stuff. It's like, she got diagnosed with, with gallbladder cancer. And that was, that was whatever. But when they went in to do the gallbladder resection to take out the re- around her liver where the tumor was still at, and they opened her up and saw it was seated in her peritoneal cavity. I was just like, why are they even giving anyone hope that she's going to survive right. this? Like right. biliary cancers are nasty as it is, stage four. And and like they were though, when my aunts were going and my mom were going to the oncology appointments with, with my grandma, mm-hmm. they were like, well, we'll give her chemo and blah, blah. Like they, they were giving right. them hope for, and, right. and I was trying to be realistic with my mom and saying like, don't have hope here. Like she'll live another couple months maybe, but like, this is going to be the end for Reality her. Reality check, right. You know, and I don't, I didn't think that was cool, honestly. No. But may, maybe it feels better for the patients that don't know anything. Right. I don't know. Well, and I think that's another aspect of it. Like, you want to give them hope because you want them to actually fight or enjoy what's left. But yeah. at the same time, it's kind of like, I want to be honest with you. <laughs> I want to tell you the truth. Yeah, so so I, I hate that just, position. Yeah. It's just like, don't ask me if you have anything exactly. wrong with Exactly. If me, anything's please. wrong with you, I don't know. Yeah, I'm it, an idiot. Ask an oncologist. Exactly. <laughs> phone a phone an oncologist, not us. We're going to tell you the dark side of the story, <laughs> right? So when you so you have autopsies mm-hmm. on kids, like what is there like a most? You know how with adults, it's like heart disease yeah. is a big one, obesity related things. Like usually, you, like lifestyle with adults, I feel like yeah. Like what what is it with kids? Like genetic so, things. So for sure, it's genetics. That's a component. Um, anomalies malformations anything that's once again dysmorphic syndromes can have a boatload going on with them most commonly we wind up seeing heart defects congenital heart defects which go into the syndromes as well Um, also we've had cases where they're just not compatible with life because of a genetic disorder or genetic syndrome have you ever seen conjoined twins 
So I had a case. Um, it was a fetus and I, it was an aborted fetus where they shared basically the same torso, had two sets of arms, two sets of legs and were joined. I think it was torso, brain. So I guess the spinal cord and brain, they shared two faces and the body was like shared. Oh, wow. That's Yeah, that's it was like super. Real... It was probably. How, the... how many weeks was the I want to say it was maybe 12, maybe. Oh, it, was so it was little. It was an itty bitty. Yeah. An itty bitty. That's interesting. But it was super cool to be able to experience that because it's not something that you see often. Yeah. Let alone have an autopsy on. I know. it's like, and, and it's like I always get shit for saying that things are cool. It's like obviously it's not cool. For it's the parents, interesting. But for, from a from a pathologic perspective, right. it's cool for us in the lab to see. It's a special interest. We, um, we just talked about in the news recently, um, Lori and George Chappelle, you know, the twin, the I heard about twins that. from Reading. Yeah. yeah. They just passed away. They were 62, the oldest living twins. Holy cow. And then we were talking about Abigail and Brittany, the, the younger twins, mm-hmm. because one of them just got married. So we were talking about like, well, how does that work? Exactly. <laughs> like r- really interesting right. stuff have you have you ever seen situs and versus i don't know if i've ever asked you that i think that so i think when I, we were in school like right. one of the students rotating there saw it possibly i don't remember i don't think it's I like have. all my it's like all my bucket list but i just think I i'll never remember. see it there's a, there's some things that i just don't remember and that's probably no, one of them i know that's so situs and versus is when all the organs are Flip. like mirror flipped yeah. so like your heart would be on the different side than than it is normally yeah. and, and your liver as opposed to the rights to the left and yeah. like you know there's malrotation and all this other craziness yeah it's just it's just crazy like you could say throughout your career even if you've done hundreds of autopsy uh, autopsies it's just like sometimes you just see like like one time i found mm-hmm. a horseshoe kidney like once mm-hmm. you know like just one time you see i've seen i found meckles actually twice but like just different things like that are yeah, that's like, another they're popular like fun. one we get yeah right yeah. that you would get that i love those yeah. i love like congenital anomalies that are like not really like life thre- well i guess <laughs> that could be life threatening but not like not really yeah like I just wrote a case for the gross room about um a baby that was born with a tail, Ooh. so it's pretty. Yeah, I'll send I'll send it to you. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I always like we always like <laughs> talk about this stuff. This is what we do. Like, she'll come over and we talk about men. Yeah, men. Um, shopping mm-hmm. and and fetal men make anomalies. up shopping <laughs> fetal anomalies. Welcome to the coffee show. <laughs> So, so this is interesting when you were talking about like lifestyle changes, because I think in adult pathology, a, like most, so many of the cases, it's like related to smoking, related mm-hmm. to drinking alcohol, related to obesity, Correct. just all these things, even work exposures, mm-hmm. just like all these things that people are environmental or just bring on even right. viral things like HPV or hepatitis C. So with little kids, I guess you don't really see that kind of stuff right we may see like as far as like infection goes sepsis if there's some kind of issue that happens there um but usually it's not lifestyle changes that are in our demographic at least the demographic i've been exposed to yeah um i don't want to say that it doesn't happen in other children's hospitals but with us it's usually there's some kind of tumor or uh, congenital heart disease um yeah we had a lot, a, a fair number of miscarriages from parent and placentas in mm-hmm. the hospital from people that were using drugs, mm-hmm. but um, I, nothing really specific that sticks out to me that you could say, oh yeah, that person was right. was on meth and that's why this baby was like this or whatever. Right. There's definitely changes within the placenta, or even sometimes some of the heart defects come from drug use. Yeah, that's so, you know, that's one aspect of it. But it's not like I'm sitting there and saying, okay, this this patient has an ASD or a VSD, which is basically a hole in the upper or lower portion of the heart. Oh, somebody must have used drugs like there's a million reasons why that could have happened. So you don't necessarily always jump to lifestyle, although it could be. Yeah, that's that's it. And I think there actually was somebody that. I think they're, I don't know, even know how we came to figure that out, but I think they had high levels of THC or something to that effect. And I think we might've actually ran something. Weed cause... does nothing bad to you. Okay. Just stick with, yes. stick with the story. Stick, stick with the script. <laughs> it's all about cancer. 
Lifestyle is wonderful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, um, so this is, this is, this is really interesting to me actually, because so working in surgical pathology, I started whatever it was, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, whatever. Um, I noticed that there was a change in some specimens we were getting and then there was a, there, you know, you're working there for five years and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you start getting like sleeve gastrectomies mm -hmm. and then you would get one a week and then it turned yep. into five a day, yep. <laughs> right? Do you have any kind of specimens like that, that like now that you've been working in the field so long, you're seeing like this is a more popular surgery versus? So definitely a lot of sleeve gastrectomies have been happening. Um, and I'd say in the last like year or two, they've picked up. So a sleeve gastrectomy is when they reduce the size of the stomach for it to try to, I, I guess it would be for childhood obesity. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, what age are you getting these things? Usually teens is where Teenagers, they're at. Teenagers, yeah. yeah. somewhere in the teenage. And same thing for the other specimen that we wound up getting are usually breast reductions. We've oh, really? Seen, you get breast reductions? There's been an increase, yeah. And I, I don't know if it's just because of our demographic, but. It's interesting because I always say, like, as much as I don't like children's hospitals, the, the best part would be that you don't get breasts because I hate breasts. I just hate them as yeah, Breasts for tumors, a whole other story. No, yeah. 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 The reductions are yeah. easier. I mean, but you still have to look at them in case. Absolutely. Just in case because, you know, there's like a fiber adenoma. It could be, it's benign, but just in yeah. case. Yeah, exactly. You can't just like throw that in right. the trash like you would at Panis <laughs> or something exactly. like that. So what, um, what are some of the differences like so when we do an autopsy it will take like I mean you could get it done in like an hour or two mm -hmm. really fast so why why does it, an autopsy on a fetus take eight hours like, so what's... well let's start with so for a fetus so there's perinatal right which is the fetus which is before birth they die or surrounding birth they die and that's usually the one that takes forever like you mentioned what was it a 16 weeker it was an oh all day God. affair it was brutal so, tracing remember you guys used to have that laptop that like was like okay look probe the bile duct then move on or and then we would, we had the whole entire the like temp yeah we had the whole template and of like, exactly what like to do the bile duct in an adult is so small mm -hmm. in a fetus it's, it's like could you, what did you have to use like it like a sewing pin to, to probe it pretty, like i can't even much. imagine and that's like that's ultimately what it comes down to you're dealing with a body that's you know three inches long and yeah. so the cavity is only maybe like two inches and you're like okay how do you how even, do I even see this? where do i start um and then Sometimes there's findings that they have question the clinicians have questions about, and you're like, uh, "What? Like, yeah, like they saw this on ultrasound yeah, or something?" Yeah, I'm confirming what? Like, how can I even possibly, you know, this grain of salt is what I'm looking for, and it gets a little bit tough at that point. But then we have like a dissecting scope, and then a enlarged image on a screen, and then that's a whole other ballpark because how in the heck do you sit there under a microscope? do an autopsy, watch a screen and make it all happen where you don't ruin anything before you can actually confirm or deny that something was or wasn't there. So starting there, it's one, they're small. So we have to slow down a little bit because trying to make that happen is difficult, technically difficult. Then you also run into, they might have had imaging and we want to prove that the imaging was correct. We also will find things that necessarily weren't found on imaging in the autopsy. So we have to slow down. Knowing normal is where we start. Knowing abnormal is where we specialize. So you have congenital anomalies, malformations. Like I was talking about the congenital heart defects. You wind up opening a heart. In an adult, you're looking for an infarct. Um, yeah, you're not going to find a hole in a heart in a 60-year-old person. Right. Like, you, the the general consensus is like if you live to be old, like you don't have any congenital correct or anything that really right. killed you like that. And if you have one, it's so small it never affected you yeah. the way it would if it were a large defect. So you wind up like having to slow down, having to look at what should be there compared to what isn't there. And there is variability in what should be there, which is a whole other, other level. thing. Yeah. <laughs> so you really have to slow down and just take a minute and go system by system and orientation and anatomy at its finest. Like you wind up being more specialized in it because now you're looking for things that 
like you were saying, if you're an adult, you're 60, you've lived your life. Nobody's really concerned if you had a small hole in your heart that you lived with. But when you're a fetus and you're syndromic, well, this is a clue as to why this fetus died. This is a clue to what we're now counseling these parents towards, like for future pregnancies. So you, you basically slow down. Plus, you might get a placenta with a perinatal autopsy. Then you have to do the whole entire examination of that. And it's very important, which you always don't get the placenta. Um, do they, do people deliver at the children's hospital? So, yes. So oh, okay. for high risk case, that's when we have a delivery at the hospital. Oh, okay. um, and I believe both institutions that I've worked for do have um, a labor and delivery unit. So oh, okay. these high risk case, they pair with an adult hospital. They come in, deliver the baby. Babies delivered at the children's hospital, then sent to the OR to have whatever surgery. Oh, okay. Something, you know, the ASD, VSD repair, or even something like a coarctation of the aorta where it's a narrowing of that lumen, they'll take out that little snippet, put a little patch in. This way, it's a normal flow of blood. Would they send that snippet to you guys? Do yes. you ever get? Uh, so you so get we get it? them, and they're just a, basically a little piece of like vessel. Like a one cassette? Mm -hmm. like one, <laughs> a one cassette <laughs> easy just confirm hey this lumen is narrow it's smaller than where it was started you know there's a spot that goes to like maybe pinpoint or like a 0 0.1 centimeter and then the rest of it's like 0 0.5 so clearly like when you have blood flow that's going to be a problem just like it would be with a funnel like yeah it'll it's get gonna slow down right oh, that's interesting all right so i'm glad that we could talk to crisper about the this pediatric pathology because I talk a lot about surgical pathology and autopsy, but like I just tend to keep my we hand. We could have out a of... mini series on pediatric pathology. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But regardless of like all this stuff that we can do at our job, I feel like one of the things that we talk about all the time is the limitations of being a PA. So when we go to school to be a pathologist assistant, it's kind of like you can get a job in the lab or you can get a job in the morgue, but like that's kind of it. Right. There's no other thing, which for us, it's fine because we love pathology and like whatever. Yeah. I'll be fine with that. But some people. Totally a nerd about it. Start, totally. Yeah, exactly. But it's and like some people go all the way through school and then they say like, oh, I would I would like to work in dermatology. And then you're like, oh, well, guess what? Like your degree means nothing and you mm -hmm. need to go back to school to do this. And so the reason that I'm bringing this up is like, do you. Do you ever find yourself like you think that you're going to do this the rest of your life? I mean, I know that you're like approaching retirement. <laughs> like now it's like, no, it's so crazy because Truth. I remember we were taught like when we when when even 10 years ago, like mm -hmm. I would be talking to Gabe about like, oh, retiring or whatever. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, my God, he's eligible to retire this year. It's just completely crazy. Yeah, and, and I mean. We're just Oldest getting talk. older. Not yeah. not that that's going to happen anytime soon, but like for the next 20 years, mm -hmm. are you, do you see yourself doing this or would you like a hundred percent to be honest, like this was something I think I was even asked early on or maybe even just talking to one of the students. It was, it's for me a hundred percent. This is what I've always wanted to do. I absolutely love the field. If I didn't need to rely on money to survive in this lovely world, I would do it for free. Like I would hands down go in and enjoy my life doing this. Like <laughs> Maybe just not every day. Just like... maybe not every day. Make, <laughs> make it like a little bit of a per diem or like a weekend gig. But um, for for sure, I joke about like, you know, being 80 and doing an autopsy and pretty much suspend me from the ceiling <laughs> and just let me do my business. You know, here I got to go to the gym, keep my like mobility up so I can <laughs> at 80 not have to worry about retiring when I can't afford anything. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and living off of social security. Yeah. I can't imagine mm. you like doing anything else, honestly. No. And that that's a like <laughs> not one bit. She she's a typical well, we all are, like this this like anti a little bit anti social, mm -hmm. like <laughs> fit in the world just fine, but like we're good <laughs> at our craft kind of thing. Well, thanks so much for being here today. This You're was welcome. very good. It was it was good for me to hear all this stuff because I certainly stay away from pediatrics as much as I can I, I think it. I think a big th reason is because I'm a mom and I have little kids I just <laughs> out of sight out of mind kind of thing mm -hmm. but it's great that there's people like you that that 
do this and don't cry over your workstation <laughs> and just like get it done. So thanks for being here. I cry in private. I'm glad you guys got to meet one of my best friends. She's here all the time and we're hanging out and it's been great. Talking smack. Yep. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Mother Knows Death. As a reminder, my training is as a pathologist assistant. I have a master's level education and specialize in anatomy and pathology education. I am not a doctor and I have not diagnosed or treated anyone, dead or alive, without the assistance of a licensed medical doctor. This show, my website, and social media accounts are designed to educate and inform people based on my experience working in pathology so they can make healthier decisions regarding their life and well-being. Always remember that science is changing every day and the opinions expressed in this episode are based on my knowledge of those subjects at the time of publication. If you are having a medical problem, have a medical question, or are having a medical emergency, please contact your physician or visit an urgent care center, emergency room, or hospital. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Mother Knows Death on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get podcasts. Thanks.